Jesus' name. Amen. All right. What we'll book of the Bible we in on Sunday uh, Wednesday night? We're in the book of Psalms 73. So if you want to find the book of Psalms 73, there is a title that was in the original manuscripts that's going to tell you the tragedy of the wicked and the blessedness of God in, I mean, trust in God. It is a psalm. Did anybody see the author's name? It was given to us. It's Asaph. He has written one of 12, and this is the first one that we're going to read by him. Most likely, he was one of the uh, worship leaders in the sanctuary. He would have been one of the people directing the music. He would have been one of the ones writing music. He would have been one of the ones leading the congregation to sing out to God. He would have been a music person. So when he's writing all of his poetry, it's really to be songs, to be sung, to bring glory to God. Now, some songs, even in our modern time, some just have a good rhythm to them. Some have got, got this good beat. Some just have words that seem to make no sense. And other times they have a beautiful story woven throughout all of it. This poem is going to be one with a beautiful story woven from the beginning all the way to the end. And you have to watch it all. Now, this is Psalm 73, which starts the third volume of the Psalms. That's divided into five different books. Now, most likely it's because they could only fit so much on scrolls and so much room in scrolls or whatever it is. So uh, we have the uh, third division starting here with uh, chapter 73. Now, I, after studying a long period of time and praying over, have come up with a different title than what is in the manuscript. I think it's sort of like appearances. Everybody is into appearances. We, we are always focused on appearances. But I want you to understand that sometimes appearances of what we see is not reality of the person we see. Whether they're dressed a certain way, drive a certain vehicle, act a certain way. Sometimes it's a reflection of who they are and other times it is not. We make assumptions based on what they are like. Even yesterday when I went and seen Brother Harold in the hospital... I walk in carrying my motorcycle helmet. The daughter walks right on in between me and stands right between me and the patient with the, the Miss Juanita. And I'm like, I started to tap him on the shoulder and say, hey, 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 I don't know who you think you are, but you ain't going to jump in front of me like that. But I realize he's the doctor. So I let him say his piece. And after he went through this long, he finds, and who are you? And they said, they introduced me as his their pastor. He goes, oh, never seen a pastor carrying a motorcycle helmet, riding a motorcycle. Seems a little awkward. And I'm thinking to myself, not to me. <laughs> it's normal to me. It's been a way of life for 40 years for me. <laughs> so it might have been awkward to him. Yeah. I didn't say not one word. We just moved right along. But we make assumptions we, based on people's appearances. Now, I titled this appearances in capital letters with a semicolon, a semicolon, and, and then up under that. The saved suffer. While the wicked win. Most people will always look at life as a game. And it's always about winning and losing. You've heard the phrase many a time. It was quoted to me when I was a little boy growing up. That, you know, he who dies with the most toys wins in life. Well, you can take that for a grain of salt however you want. But what happens is when we take our eyes and stop focusing on what we have been blessed with and start looking at what other people have been blessed with. And then we look at the wicked who profane God, who blasphemy God, who talk down to Christians because they think we're stupid and they have it all. We can become very angry to us and we can become very jealous of that. We can be envious of that saying, Lord, I've served you. Why ain't I being blessed? It looks like the wicked are being blessed every time they turn around. They can't go anywhere without making money. They can't go anywhere without getting these fancy things. They got the nice house. They got the nice fancy car. They, got, they seem to have it all. See, when your eyes are on materialistic things, it looks like the wicked may be winning. But remember, that's a, an appearance. Well, Asaph, who is a worship leader... He is going to take us through a period of his time in his life where his eyes were not focused on God. They looked, he looked at people and what they had. And it made him upset. And he's going to share that with us. 
In chapter 73, verse 1, he starts like a lot of the Psalms with the conclusion of what he's fixing to build a case for. But this is the conclusion. This is what he said at the very end, and he's reminding himself at the very beginning. So as they would have signed this out in church, truly God is what? Good. Good. That's right. Now, we know that's become popular in the last 20 years because we've got an amazing man named Don Moen who wrote a song that was so passionate, so powerful. And then he started this. God is good. No, all the time. God is good. And how is it? God is good all the time. Yeah. I mean, we heard it all the time, and now I can't even think of it. So it's amazing how you don't write it down. This is a fact that everyone would agree with that was there to worship that God is good to Israel and to us, to such who are pure in heart. When we wake up every morning, this is a fact that is true, and it should be a thought in our mind that God is good. When we go throughout our day, it should be a fact that we remind ourselves throughout the day that God is good. When we lay down our, at night to sleep, it should be a fact that we acknowledge to ourselves that God is good. Not that He has been good, but He is good. He's current. He's not trapped in a time. He is good, and it's a, a present tense. He is always present tense for us. When we take our eyes, our thoughts, our desires off of God and His goodness, then this is what can happen in verse 2. But as for me, my feet almost, what? Stumbled. Stumbled. My steps had nearly, what? What He's saying is, I almost slipped and lost my balance and fell into sin. That's what He's saying. As a, who knew God to be good, yet He had doubts that almost caused Him to fall from His faith. Doubting is not incompatible with the Christian faith. Some of you here have, can probably look back in your time where you've doubted certain things of God. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to even question God. It's okay to even ask God. Sometimes we think that it's blasphemy if we ask God to clarify things or if we challenge God on something. He's a pretty doggone big God. He can handle whatever you throw at Him. He's wanting you to go to Him. And sometimes when we go to Him being honestly transparent and saying, Lord, I just don't get this. I just, I just don't, I can't grasp it. That's what the author is saying. He's saying, I cannot grasp it. And he's going to actually use those words in a few minutes. He's having doubt. Doubt is not incompatible with our Christian faith. The key is we cannot let doubt be our desired destination. Cannot be our destination. It cannot be where we're going. It cannot be where we stay. We have to keep going. God never despises our doubt. Although He wants you, He wants me, He wants you to see Him conquer your doubts through you. He don't want to do something big and fancy for you. He wants to work through you. He wants you to be available to Him so that you get to see what He can do and how He can bless you and those around you. In verse, uh, When we move into verse 3, we're going to see what caused Asaph to almost stumble and fall. Look what it says in verse 3. For I was envious of the who? Those boastful. When I saw the prosperity of who? The wicked. He sees the prosperity. So his eyes are not on what he has. His eyes are on what they have. And it looks like the wicked are winning in life. They have it all. So it, it seems unfair to him. Now, most people cannot doubt that God has been good to them. But when we see the wicked, and it looks like Nothing is slowing them down. Nothing bothers them. They get it all. And I understand that most of the time when we're looking, we never look at people that are in our same level of society. We always look at the ones that are much better off than us. We, we look at them and we say, they're wicked. They hate God. They talk bad about God's people. And look, they got a big monster house. So we're looking at the materialistic things. We're listening to the wicked things they say. We should take our eyes off of what God has done. Now, Asher is questioning the moral universe. Because what makes sense to us as men and women, people, is that if you're good, 
good things should happen to you. And if you're bad, bad things should happen to you. But that's not life. That's not reality. That's not the way God created. And whenever God created and it was perfect, man who entered sin into this world caused it to be a problem. Now, you may remember Job. Job had a bad time. You know, they, he even had friends came and sat with him and they questioned his righteousness. You might even remember that in the Gospel of John chapter 9, when the disciples came to Jesus over this crippled man and, and who has been crippled since birth, and they challenged Jesus saying, who sinned, his parents or him? Because he's born crippled. And Jesus said, neither, neither one of them. Because, see, they had a false understanding of reality. Folks, have true sense of reality. Remember what God says in his word. He has told us, he has revealed, he has showed us that the son's going to come up on the wicked as well as the righteous. He's going to rain blessings down on the wicked as well as the righteous. The good things happen to good people is a myth. We need to make sure that we keep ourselves in check that we're not focusing on what everybody else has and become discouraged of, over what we think we lack. If you do that, then it appears the wicked have won. They are winning. Look at verse 4. For there are no pains in their death, but their strength is firm. They are healthy and they don't struggle to survive. Some of you may say that they're fat. That word fat is not talking about obese. It's talking about that they're healthy, that they have food, that they, they look strong, they look pretty, they look handsome, they, they, they look well off. Because they are well off. And then you get to the next part. In verse 5 it says, They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. That word plagued it means stricken. In the Greek it means to be divinely punished. They appear to have no troubles, no suffering like the rest, and especially like the righteous. So it looks like they're winning with prosperity. It looks like they're winning with health. It looks like they're even winning in death. If they don't struggle a long period of time of death, they just live a good life and then die. Now, the author obviously is trying to make a point. So in poetry, sometimes you want to exaggerate things to bring home a point. Now, does the author actually think that everybody that's wicked is like this? Probably not, because if he's looked around, he's probably seen some wicked people that are just as poor as him. Some wicked people that are suffering just like him. Some wicked people. He's probably, he would see that. But see, that's where, not where his eyes are. His eyes are on who is living life well. Who looks like they're winning at life, and he's chalked it up to be the wicked. Now, you may remember the wisest man to ever live. He wrote a book called Ecclesiastes and, and, and King Solomon. He starts talking about chasing after wealth, chasing after this, chasing after that. And the bottom line was it all leads to vanity. It's all vanity. It's all worthless. It's all wasteful. Except the worship of God. That's almost what Asher is getting, going to get to. So he's pointing out all this that it looks like they're winning him. They, they don't even suffer. So the saved suffer and the wicked win. Look at verse 6. Therefore, pride serves as their what? As their necklace and violence covers them like a garment. They are proud and they are hateful. This is an easy way to, is, is easy to see jewels and fancy clothes that they wear. Their fulfillment of their lustful appetites and boast about how wicked, uh, about, about their wicked accomplishments. What it's saying is, these people walk around and talk about how good they are. How good they've got it. What they've amassed. I have this, you have nothing. I have, they're saying things to be hurtful to other people who do not have because that makes them feel more superior to them. It's sort of like putting them in their place. And Asa does not like that. Look what he says in verse 7. He says, their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than the heart could wish. In other words, if they see something they want, they just go and take it. They do whatever they want. He's talking about pride and violence. He's talking about eyes. He's talking about the heart. He's going to continue talking about different parts of the body. He's saying they've got it made. When they look at stuff, they can just go and take it. It's talking about going back to prosperity, going back to the wealth. Now, we know that wealth in itself is not bad. It's how that wealth is used. 
There's a lot of godly people that have a lot of wealth that use it in godly ways. But he's not looking at that. He's looking at the wicked winning in life because they have it all. While he does not. Look at the next part in, in verse uh, uh, 8. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak lawfully. They make fun of others and they say cruel things to them. In their pride, they make plans to hurt people with their mouth, with their speech. Their lofty uh, language there is from a secure position, out of harm's way, untouchable. Yes, it appears that the wicked will always win. Look at verse 9. They set their what? Oh, their mouth now against the heavens and their tongue walk through the earth. Your translation may say something like they think they're God's. They think that they are the rulers of the earth. See, this is full-blown pride, full-blown arrogance. They think they're somebody because of what they have. And then look at verse 10. Therefore, his people return here and waters are uh, of a full cap, a cup, are drained by them. Even God's people turn to them and do what they say. See, the aurora of success... <laughs> And their readiness with their words, the, the people are attracted to them. They don't see anything wrong with them. They want to go and hear from them. They want to learn from them. Hey, how did you get so wealthy? What did you invest in? What did you do? How did you do that? How did you... See? And he's saying even the godly people are going after seeking their counsel. Now, you are wise people. You know that the Bible tells us not to seek wisdom from the world, but to seek wisdom from God. You know that God says to go to other believers to get godly counsel. Don't go to lost because their values, their direction is not in line with yours and it won't match up. That's why a lot of people come to me and they'll say, hey, do you know a Christian counselor? Because even they know that in counseling, you need someone who aligns scripturally Versus someone who aligns worldly to get the right insight. Look at verse 11. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? <laughs> Those evil people say God does not know what we are doing. God most high does not know. That's what they're saying. And they're saying it with their arrogance. They're saying it with their pride. These prideful people either do not believe in God. Or they believe that God does not care about the, 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 the struggles or the blessings of humanity. Oh, they're, they're gods. They're too busy. Not one god. They're, they're many gods. And they make fun of that. Because they seem to have it all. Because see, the wicked seem to be winning. Look what it says in verse 12. Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. And saying that those people are wicked and that they become richer and keep getting richer. The psalmist is bothered by the fact that these wicked people seem to be able to enjoy life, drink all that they want, party all that they want, and live an easy life. A life that anyone would like to have. See, the wicked are winning. And then verse 13, surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. It's saying clearly I have gained nothing by keeping my thoughts pure. What good is it to keep myself from sin? The writer is questioning God with doubt, saying, God, I have lived for you. I have been doing your work. I have lived as pure in my thoughts as possible, as righteous and with my actions as possible, and I'm struggling. I have nothing, and these wicked have it all. Do you see how doubting can create a problem if that's the destination because more doubting is going to beget more doubting and people continue to get more bitter and more bitter and more bitter when they feed the bitterness. That's why I tell you often, quit watching news. If it makes you upset, quit watching it. You got the facts of what's going to happen right here in Scripture. You don't need to listen to what men are saying. You can focus on what God has already said and understand that it will happen. They're just guessing at what could happen. God's already declared what will be. So you need to focus on him and what he says. Look at verse 12 again. It says, behold, these are ungodly who always are at ease and they increase in the riches. And verse 13 says, surely I have cleansed my heart in vain. Do you see the, uh, the, the uh, contrast there? And then look what he says in verse 14. For all day long, I have been what? Plague. That word plague means stricken or divinely punished. 
Not only have I been plagued, then he goes a little more worse. He says, and chastened. That implies that God intentionally inflicts pain and suffering on Asa. He's saying, I've been plagued and chastened by God every morning. God, I suffer all day long. And you punish me from the beginning of the day. Now, maybe Asa is at the age where his joints hurt every time he gets up out of bed. Maybe he's at the age where he can't do what he used to do and he's complaining about his physical inefficiencies. Whatever it is, he's saying, Lord, you punish me all day long. I have to live with this. Paul lived with that. You remember Paul? He had a thorn in his side. He said, Lord, take this thorn out of my side. And, and God said, no, because when you're weak, I can be made strong through you. Asa is looking at everybody else having everything else going well and not him. And he's specifically focusing on the wicked. Here, he's complaining now about himself. He seems to not even be uh, wanting to be alive. Look at verse 15. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children, of God's children. In other words, he's saying, I wanted to tell others these things. What things? About how the weak are winning, how they got it all. And we try to keep ourselves righteous, clean, and pure, and we have nothing. We we get up in the scene and, and we got rags on, and, and they go out and they have a, a time to party with the finest of attire. He said it just ain't right. He said he could have spoke that, but he would have been a traitor to his people. If he boasted about how well the wicked were living, then he would be just as bad as the wicked who were saying mean and hateful things to other people. And he realizes that, thankfully, in verse 16. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. In other words, he tried hard to understand all that was going on, but it was just too hard to grasp. He's looking at it from all angles, provided no peace. No understanding about the situation. How can God's people suffer and the wicked live easy lives? It just doesn't seem fair. It just doesn't make sense. It's not just. But now, you can probably picture the first few verses going with a minor key or some kind of real deep sound in the background. Now, it's going to get a little bit higher pitch. Now, it's going to speed up in tempo because now he's going to start having this uh, re reveal to us how God enlightened him as he took his focus off of the wicked all around and onto God. Now, look what he says in verse 17. He, in verse 16, he couldn't understand it. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't figure it out. But in verse 17, until I went into what? Alright folks, this is proof that he's feeling low, he's feeling bad, and what does he do? He goes to church. That should be a clue to us. When we're feeling bad, when we're not wanting to do something, especially on a Sunday, go to church anyway. If you knew how many times I had people come up to me on Sunday and say, I am hurting so bad that I probably won't be able to make it through the service. I might not be able to stay. Oh pastor, I I'm surprised I am even made it here. And then after the service, I feel so good. I feel so relieved. I feel unburdened. And yet the ones that didn't make it are usually at home whining and complaining they didn't feel any better. But they missed the blessings of worship. So Asaph goes to church. Now, whether he's leading the service, you know, sort of like that joke that, you know, the mom comes into the room, wake the son up, say, you got to go to church, got to go to church. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to go to church today. You got to go to church today. I don't want to. You're the pastor. Get up. You know, it's that kind of thing, you know. So Asa may have felt guilty that he's going. Maybe it was his off week. He didn't have to leave worship. Maybe he didn't want to go to worship anyway, but he goes to the sanctuary. Maybe he is going to be the worship leader. And he's dealing with these doubts. Outward appearances that everything's okay, but in inwardly falling apart. That's the way a lot of people are on Sundays. They're falling apart inside, but they put on a happy face. They act like it's all okay. How's it going? I was going to do it. It's not, but they say it. Because see, we expect that. We teach them to be those Pharisees. We teach people to say that. Because we understand that we probably don't really want to hear the truth. I've had people say, do you really want to know the truth? Do you want me to tell you the truth? I'll say, no, you can tell me a little bit later, not before I preach. I'll hear it later. I'll hear it later. 
here. He can't grasp it, but then he goes to church. Look at the last part. Then I understood therein. Now, another translation says, but then I went into your temple, God, and I understand what will happen to the wicked. So he rediscovered something he probably already knew, but not considered because he had been looking outwardly and inwardly focused instead of upwardly focused like we've been talking about. The prosperity of the wicked will not last. Their wealth will not have any eternal value. He found this or he was reminded of this when he went to church to worship God. So I'm curious because I'm a pastor and my brain's not put together exactly like other people's. Was it something someone prayed? Because we already talked about prayer. We got to talk about the importance of prayer. Was it somebody that prayed out loud that spoke to his heart? Maybe it was a song that was sang, a message in the song. Maybe it was a powerful word of the preacher preaching God's truth. Regardless of what it was actually that caused him to be enlightened to his have his eyes open, to be reminded of it was still God speaking to him and he was listening. You get that? So it ain't just about going to church and going through a service. It's about going to church to worship God collectively with other people. That's greatly important. We've got to have prayer. We've got to have music. We've got to have the word. We've got to. Those are the ingredients to worship God. Whether you're doing it privately or whether you're doing it corporately, those are the ingredients to, to worship God. Now, he's going to go on. Not only did he was he uh, God speaking to him, but he was listening and he was learning and then he was willing to apply these truths to his life so that he can live it out through his life from the point of understanding now because it makes sense to him. He finally gets it because he was looking from God's point of view. We can't be looking outward, everybody else. We can't even look inward. We always need to be looking upward. Paul said, keeping his eye on the prize of the high calling. That is looking upward. That is talking about eternal things, looking for the future. And it will help you in the here and now. In verse 18, surely, and he's talking to God, he says, surely you set them on slippery places. You cast them down to what? Oh, Destruction. In other words, he made it easy for them to fall and to be destroyed. See, in verse 2, Asaph was um, the one who almost slipped and fell into sin. However, he now understands that the wicked are in slippery places and they will fall into destruction. Remember, when your faith seems to be slipping, when you are, are, are filled with doubts, remind yourself that your trust is not in yourself. Your trust is not in your abilities. Your trust is not in your wealth. Your trust, if it's right, should be in God. Who owns it all, has it all, endures it all. Amen. And wants to bless you with it. In verse 19, oh, how they are brought to, what word? Desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with what? Terrors or dread. So you got the destruction, the desolation, desolation and dread. Trouble can, uh, can come suddenly and they will be ruined. See, we are not promised our next breath. They are not promised to walk in their wealth. It only takes a moment. Remember the prodigal son? Took all of the wealth that he was entitled to and went and squandered it. Had a bunch of parties. Had a bunch of people showing up for those parties. He was the highlight of the town. He was on the front page of every paper. Everybody wanted to be his friend. But when he ran out of money, he had no friends. He had nothing. And you remember he went to work and he was so hungry that he, a Jew, looked at the pig squalor of what they were going to eat and wanted to eat those pods, which they thought pigs were unclean. And here he is having to work in that. And then he came to a senses, let me go to my dad and tell him, hey, you know what? I blew it. Let me be your servant. I don't want to be your son anymore. I'll be your servant. See, he learned the lesson that while he had it all and he was winning the race, he had it, he had it all. They did not have his family. He did not have the Lord watching over him. He did not have these things that he really wanted, but he didn't realize that. 
and knew that his dad was going to rebuke him, knew that his dad was going to probably treat him a little bit worse. And what happened when his dad saw him? Gave him a hug, called for the, the robe, get the ring, put it back on his finger. My son was lost, but now he's found. And it's a beautiful parable of the lost that are out there that are wicked, that seem to be winning. That they have it all, they need nothing. But they can lose it all in a moment. As a matter of fact, not only could they lose their wealth in a moment, they could lose their life. And then all that they amassed was to give to someone else to enjoy. Because they can't take it with them. What did Jesus tell us? He says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Because see, where your treasure is... There the desire of your heart will be. Here, this writer is realizing they don't come to destruction, desolation, and dread or terror. They will face the Creator who they rejected, and He will separate them from Him for all eternity. All that they amass will be given to someone else. They will stand empty-handed and spiritually empty, and they will enter into an eternity without God. In verse 20, as a dream, when one awakes, so Lord, when you awake, now you think God was sleeping? Don't ever think God's sleeping. Don't ever think God's ignoring you. Don't ever think God don't see it. God sees it all, knows it all, hears it all, understands it all, but he has perfect time because he's not restricted to time like us. Here, the, the, the writer is saying, Lord, as if, if you were to awake, you shall despise their image. You will make them disappear like monsters in our dream. They will spend the eternity in a nightmare of a dream. Their reality was but brief. And then their eternity will be destruction, desolation, and dread. Their whole life would have seemed like a distant memory, not lasting very long with no benefit. And now reality of eternity sets in. In verse 21, when the author, when Asa realizes, when he grasps, Eternity and the punishment that they will endure. These wicked that he's been envious of. These wicked that seem like they have been winning while he being saved have been suffering. Look at the next verse because now God has changed his heart. Look what he says in verse 21. Thus my heart was what? Grieved, Grieved and I was vexed in my mind. See, understanding God's truth regarding eternity caused Asim to be sad for those who seem to have it all, and yet they're going to end, go into eternity with nothing. In verse 22, I was so foolish and arrogant. I mean, I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. In other words, he was saying, I was stupid, God. I was upset and I was angry with you. I acted like a senseless animal in verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right. What? Yes. This is a reminder that God never left him. Even though he struggled with doubts. Even when he was filled with envy and wanted what others seemed to have. God had a hold of his hand, keeping him from slipping away. You know, that's like your little child, your little grandchildren, great grandchildren, you know, they're little, when they, you know, about this tall, you know, about, when they're about two years old, three years old, they just start walking, you know, you hold your hand and you're walking with them. They decide they want to go that way and they go that way and you just keep walking and hold your hand and keep pulling them because you know this is the right way, but they want to go that way. Especially if you're going down to the shopping center and, and all of a sudden you see, they see candy, you know, they want to go right to the candy. I don't know, we're going this way. When you got a hold of them, they're not going anywhere else because you're bigger, you're stronger, you got a hold of them. God is bigger and stronger than all of us and He's got a hold of us. Amen. When you invite Him into your heart, you turn your life over to Him. He never leaves you, forsakes you. He never lets you go. Now, He will hold on to you and let you get on over there that candy. He'll let you dabble around. He'll let you play with sin. Until He will not. And then you have to face the punishment because He disciplines those He loves. Sometimes it's a quick swat on the leg. Other times you've got to take the belt off. So he's going to get your attention. So the key is to stay focused on Him. Stop focusing outward. Stop focusing inward. Focus upward on Him. He's got you by the hand. As we get close to the end, look at verse 24. It says, talk to God now. You will guide me with your what? Your counsel or your advice. Through every day God is with us. God will guide you if... You take time to talk to Him. If you take time to listen to Him, God will give you the advice you need for every challenge that comes your way. And He wants to bless you through those. But you've got to be able to identify those blessings that He gives you every day. Don't neglect them. Don't take them for granted. Asa was taking everything for granted that he had because he was looking at what he did not have. 
And then we get, um, you, you, know, you know, your pains, don't take it for granted. It can get worse. It can get worse. You got little pains, you got big pains, guess what? You got more pains that can come. Be grateful that they're small. And then when they get larger, then cry out to God and say, why are you letting me endure? When you get sleep, be thankful. You got a job, be thankful. You got people around you in your life that they care about you, be thankful. You got things that make life easy, be thankful. When you, look at verse 24, you will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to what? This is what changes the perception of the psalmist. His focus was turned away from himself and on to God and eternity. So that word afterward, it's after my life is over on this earth. Then you, God, will receive me into your glory. The righteous will have the privilege of living with God in his presence forever. We have to maintain the proper perspective and focus upward on what he has done and what he's going to do. In verse 25, when I, what, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. He's saying, in heaven, God, I have only you. And if I am with you, what on earth could I want? See? Before, he thought the wicked was winning because they had amassed great prosperity. <clears throat> and he was jealous of that. But when he realized that their prosperity is going to be left and they're going to be standing before God empty-handed. And here he is, poor, suffering, saved. He's going to be standing before God empty-handed. And God's going to give him everything. It's all about the attitude. It's all about where we're focused. And then he goes on in verse 26. My flesh and my heart fail. Let's talk about when he physically dies. And he will eventually physically die. Everybody will physically die. They will. Their flesh and their heart will fail them. But God is the strength of my what? Heart and my portion forever. When I was talking to Harold yesterday, I told him, I was like, you know, you can go questioning life. You can say, should I do it or should I not? Because he, he had an option. Do I get a pacemaker put in or do I not? There's chances, there's problems. If I don't, there's chance, there's problems. If I do, you know, and, and, and I said, well, Brother Harold, just look at it this way. If it's your time to go, it don't matter if they put one in or not. You're going to go. You cannot stop that from happening. But you know where you're going to go. You know who has your hand. You know who's watching over you. You know who's giving you the strength. So just rely on him and say, okay, Lord, if you allow man to create this, to give us longer life, and I can take advantage of that, if I die, I'm going to be with you. I'll be healed. <laughs> and if I don't, maybe this will be something to give me a better, longer period of life with more energy and strength. And then I said, I ain't telling you what to do. I'm just praying for you. And we just prayed and I left and he decided to go ahead and have that put in. So praise the Lord. Hopefully he'll be able to do much, much better. We will see that. Our flesh will fail us. Our heart will fail us. But God is the one who us who are saved, who may be suffering right now. He is our strength of our heart. He is our portion forever. Look at verse 27. For indeed, those who are far from you shall what? Oh, they're far from you. They're going to perish. You have destroyed all of those who desert you for harlotry. There will always be those who may seem in appearances to be enjoying great fame and fortune. But it will not last. It's all about who they place their trust in. Do they place their trust in that fame, in those fortunes? They'll be saddened when they stand before God. And finally, verse 28. But it is good for me and all believers, all who love the Lord, to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord that I may declare all of God's works, all of your works, Lord. Only those who place their trust in God will find eternal life and eternal peace. Contentment with God is amazing how it brings contentment from God. Are you living a life of contentment? Or do you want, 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 want? You can have it all in here, in your heart, if you have the right focus in your upward focus. Don't look outward at others. Don't even look inward at what you don't have. Look at what God has blessed you with. Follow after Him. It may be an appearance that the saved suffer while the wicked win, 
But in reality, we have won and we will win. And our win is eternal. They only win briefly. And then it's a nightmare for the rest of their eternity. But it's their choice. That's why God says it's tough for wealthy people to come to know him. Because they put their trust in what they have. They don't need him. But yet the poor, the downcast, those that are cast out, they'll come to him because they have nothing. And he promises everything. Amen. Now you can close your eyes. Father, we can thank you that you love us so much that even in our un- ugliness, you still love us. You still believe in us. You still work through us. Father, help us. Even when we're doubting your reality in our life, even when we're doubting your goodness, even when we're doubting your blessings, help us to stop looking outward. Stop looking inward at what we think we don't have. Help us to look upward at what we have and what it will be for all eternity and how you will work through us. Help us to encourage others that may go through the same difficulties we go through and have those same type of doubts. That we can be an encourager to them. That we can remind them that God is good. And you are good all the time. And we thank you so much for that. We pray blessings upon those that are here. Be with us and go throughout the rest of this week. And we'll look for someone we can share you with. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.